Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. But for now, I'm here to help you rest and hopefully fall asleep if that is your intention. And you may be new to this podcast, especially because I have put in the show notes that I'm going to be sharing about my experiences with Richard Simmons, who was a wonderful exercise instructor and so much more. And you may have clicked on this podcast and wonder now what you've gotten yourself in for. (laughs) So I will share just a little bit about what to expect from this podcast, how it is designed, and also if you're just interested in the Richard Simmons sharing that I'm going to be doing, I'll put the timestamp in the show notes and you can go right there. But before you do, I will say... There is no gossip and no speculation in this. I I happen to be someone who has lived in a large-sized body for most of my life. And Richard and his work were an oasis of inspiration and safety and encouragement for me. And I was blessed to be a regular at his exercise studio Slimmons in Beverly Hills, and that will be the perspective with which I share. So if you're interested in that part of this episode, you can go right over there and I'll put the the time in the show notes when I start that part of the narrative. So this podcast is a mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and also using a sleep podcast to help me fall asleep every night. So in this first part of the episode is where we explore different spiritual principles and I call the angels in to be with us. It is a good time for you to get ready for bed. And I say that even knowing some of you listen during the daytime, which is completely wonderful. So however you're guided to use this podcast, you have my blessing. But if you're using this to help yourself get ready for bed, I invite you to allow yourself to begin to wind down. That you have done enough for this day. And you have my encouragement to get cozy and comfortable in whatever way works best for you. And as you do, I'm sending you ripples of love. And what I wanted to explore a little bit in the first part of our time together is about a concept that perhaps you have heard about before, 
which is that of an earth angel, or you might have heard this as a light worker, or a light bearer, or a bringer of light. And you might wonder if you are one, is this part of your mission on the planet? And I would say if you're listening to this podcast, I'm fairly confident that this is you. I always think of someone who is an earth angel as you have come here to leave the world a bit brighter that you are here to help bring more love into this realm. I have shared with you before, but there is a piece of prose that is often attributed to Emerson, but he did not write it. But one of the lines in the prose says, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived this is to succeed and I read that for the first time when I was about 18 or 19 years old and there's more to the piece of prose but that's the line that always stood out for me and I released it like a prayer or a wish into the universe, that that one day I would be able to say that about my life because it seems so magnificent that even one life could breathe easier because I have lived that just seemed like this profound achievement. What would that mean? Because through the consciousness of an 18 or 19 year old person, (laughs) it was hard to understand this concept. And I don't have a cool story to tell you that I then started a nonprofit. And (laughs) by the time I was 25, I had reached 300,000 people. I have no such story to share with you. I became a very normal 20-something where life was very much about my experiences and my adventures and I didn't have a strong service component to my life. But still, that adage always stayed with me. And it wasn't really until I went through my awakening in 2000 that I really came to appreciate it. You know, so often when we think of success, we think of achievements, right? You think about the people that we tend to idolize in society, right? They might be wealthy or they might be influencers They might be profoundly beautiful or handsome or the most talented athletes. And that really has to do with what they've achieved, right? External goals. And it's not that those things aren't good. But I think there is something profoundly intimate and soul inspiring to acknowledge the moments of kindness and generosity and compassion that we bring into the world on a regular basis that might help someone breathe easier in that moment. That is monumental to know that one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to succeed. Many years ago, on one of the earlier episodes of Oprah, before she was huge Oprah, right? The one that 
Suede Society, Oprah. This was when her talk show, I think, was in the earlier days. And it was a panel discussion about people who had had near-death experiences. And I've always been mesmerized by this, right? This idea of what happens beyond this realm has always fascinated me. And one of the people who was sharing was talking about their experience of a life review, which perhaps you've heard this concept before, but the way he shared it was, when you transition from this life, you go through a life review from an ascended perspective and you see and experience exponentially the ripple of your life. So if they have brought a lot of love into the world, they experience that exaltation. But a ripple is the way he described it. And I internalized that as, you know, when you throw a pebble into a pond and it ripples, that each of our lives have a ripple. And I don't think that it's ever expected that all of our ripples are positive. I I don't know that that is possible. I think all of us dwell in the shadow and in the light, right? So our ripples are complicated. (laughs) And I think there's a tremendous amount of understanding and compassion that comes from the higher realms. I have never experienced the angels as judgmental. But I love this invitation that it's not about achieving perfection. It's not about having to achieve fame or wealth or accolades. The invitation is, has has someone's life in the simplest of ways been made easier even for a moment of time because you have lived? That's something we can all achieve, right? That's something, if you listen to this podcast, you do this on a daily basis, I am sure. If you are kind to the people who check you out at the grocery store, if you have a cold bottle of water for your mail carrier on a really hot day, if you share the tomatoes from your garden with your neighbors, if you comfort a friend who is grieving, these are ways that we bring ripples of love and comfort and kindness into this world. And this is what it is to serve as a bringer of light an earth angel, a light bearer, a light worker. To know that one life has breathed easier because you have lived. And so I invite you to take a breath and I I really want to encourage you to allow the angels to help illuminate for you your ripples because I think it is all too easy to get caught up in what we have not done. We all have a list of accomplishments or dreams or even to-dos that we have not done or we have not done yet. And those can take up a lot of space in our consciousness because I think all of us have a healthy inner critic who likes to say, yeah, but you haven't, whatever, fill in the blank. Or you can't fit into your skinny jeans. <laughs> or all you're doing is wearing your sweatpants. Or you haven't written your book. You know, that part of us that somehow keeps score. But we forget to breathe and remember all of the moments of beauty 
and love that we have helped co-create in our lives. Some with people we know intimately and some for perfect strangers that we will never meet again. So I invite you to take a deep breath in and allow the angels to help illuminate for you your ripples of love and goodness. Because I promise you many, many lives have breathed easier because you are living here now. You are one of the ways God's love is made visible on this planet. You are a blessing here on earth and the world is better because you are here. So take a deep breath in. And the angels are already here, but I am going to call them in so you will know they are here as well. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here now and I ask that you bring forward waves and waves of love and goodness and kindness and compassion to each of our beloveds who are listening now. Help them come into a beautiful state of awareness of the brightness of the ripple of their life. Help to ease our burdens and our worries so that we may stand in service to our brighter tomorrows. I ask that you bring in waves of inspiration and encouragement to help each one of us become even more of who we are as beloveds of God. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in, acknowledging and loving who you are in this moment as a divine being in human form. You are wondrous. You are filled with magic and there are beautiful moments still to come your way. May the days and weeks, months and years ahead be filled with love and joy and awesome adventures for you. But for now, you get to rest. You don't have to figure anything out. You don't have to have any answers. You just rest. Let your body rest and your mind and your heart. <laughs> just let your body drift off and your consciousness drift off with it into the great mystery of sleep. And while you rest, the angels will watch over you. And I'm going to tell you a story. So as I already previewed for you, I'm going to be sharing a love letter, a love note for Richard Simmons. For those of you outside of the U.S. or those of you who are much younger than I am, you might not know who he is. Richard was really big in the 80s and the 90s as an exercise instructor, but so much more than that. I first became aware of him in the 80s because I was watching General Hospital and for about four years there, he played himself. And Richard is, um, I would say he's probably, I don't know, maybe five, six. I'm five, six. So I think he's somewhere around my height, maybe a little taller, maybe a little shorter. He had really curly hair and he was a really vibrant loud personality in the best way possible. And he would wear these short gym shorts that had 
rhinestones on them and a tank top. And he would get people sweating with the oldies. That was his thing. And Richard used to be heavier as a child and as a teenager. And so this formed a lot of his perspective in the world. That he knew what it was to be different. He knew what it was to be teased and marginalized. And he created a community of inclusivity, the likes of which I had never before experienced. So to share about my experiences with Richard, and and I need to tell you, I don't personally know him. I don't have any inside gossip, no speculation. When I say this is a love letter to him, it is because I am filled with so much gratitude for who he has been to so many of us. He was our champion at a time we did not have champions. He helped humanize obesity. He helped make space for it. He did not shame. He did not mock. So let's go back to what life was like for somebody who was heavy in the 80s. Even right now in 2022, obesity is somewhat of a mystery. They're starting to understand it more. They're starting to understand that this is likely hormonal, metabolic, has to do with the autonomous nervous system. But in the 80s, it was really thought to be an issue of willpower and choice. So as someone who is obese or overweight or fat, whatever word we want to call it, and it's interesting, at that time I wasn't even that overweight. Like I would give anything to weigh what I weighed in the 80s, (laughs) let me just tell you. But I, I was definitely perceived as much bigger than other people and I felt much bigger than other people. And I, and I don't want to make this about a sad story about that time. I'm really just more interested in helping to reflect what it was like then that the conventional wisdom was that all you had to do was eat less and move more. So for anyone that was perpetually overweight, it was somehow our fault. And truly, for most of my adult life, that is how I had metabolized it. There was something wrong with me that I couldn't accomplish the simplest of achievements, which was a normal body weight. Every article, every diet, every medical professional, every gym, it's like, well, eat less and move more as if I had never contemplated that before. It's like, oh my God, thank you. That is a revelation. Never before had I contemplated that might be the issue. (laughs) And it was very painful and confusing. Also in the 80s, um, just go back and Google exercise in the 80s. It was very much about fitness and the garments for women at that time usually involved a leotard and tights. Really um, talk about a trauma (laughs) inducing wardrobe. I had I think a purple leotard and some tights because we didn't know about yoga pants or leggings at that point and If you Google any of the pictures, if you see Jane Fonda's exercise stuff or, um, you know, 
whoever was in the movie Perfect. It's a lot of very thin women with high cut leotards and tights. And here I was, this very plump girl. <laughs> we didn't even know from Spanx back then, right? It's like, you know, things like Spanx weren't a thing back then. We had girdles and no one my age was ever going to acknowledge wearing a girdle. Like, like Spanx are cool now. Nothing like that existed that was cool back then. So I usually would wear a leotard and tights and a t-shirt over it. And I just could not keep up with the classes. Back then, step aerobics was a big thing. I would always be in the back of the class and I couldn't keep up. And here would be these much thinner women. And they would stack their steps for step aerobics three high and I could barely do one. And I, I don't know that anyone ever was really judgmental about me to my face. But I was really judgmental about myself. I felt very embarrassed going into gyms and and the fact that I had to shop at Lane Bryant. It, it's become much more normalized now than it was in the 80s. But again, I think in the 80s, it was really perceived that this was a personal will issue. And so, oh my God, I send so much love and compassion to all of us who were on that journey back then because it was hard. <laughs> it was really tough. So along comes Richard. Richard, this very bright, shiny character of a man. And he would cheer us on. And he had such compassion in his heart. Like who we were and how we were was just fine. And I wouldn't say that it was body positivity in the way we know that. He definitely was all about helping us lose weight and resist the cookie. And he definitely was teaching from the perspective of what the knowledge base was at that time. But I also will say he created a very safe space for us. So here I was in the 80s, lots of thin girls with high cut leotards and tights at gyms, <laughs> and I in my roly poly body trying to figure out what on earth am I doing wrong. And that's really the worst feeling, no matter what we're trying to accomplish, right? We all have areas in our life. I don't care how accomplished you are. I would imagine you have one or two areas in your life where you have not been able to create movement. This happened to have been one of mine. And it often would get internalized. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> and um, I have such compassion for myself around this now. I know so much more than I once did. But back then, it was challenging. So Richard comes onto the scene, bright and shiny and energetic and outrageous in some ways, uh, like a big, big personality. And he's inviting people forward to join him. So I, I would see him on talk shows and things like that. You also have to remember, in the 80s and the early 90s, this is before the internet. So, how could you find out more about where he taught? Well, you couldn't go to his website because it didn't exist. So, I remember hearing that he would teach in Beverly Hills, that he had an exercise studio there. And... I would go to the yellow pages and look up Richard Simmons and there wasn't anything I could find because that's really how you had to look things up back then. And every once in a while, I would hear that he would travel a lot and teach classes around the country. And I was always kind of curious about how to 
take one of his classes. I thought it was kind of cool, sweating to the oldies, and there were bodies that looked like mine, and bodies that were bigger than mine, and bodies that were smaller than mine, and it looked like if I got to go there, I wouldn't feel different. And when you grow up feeling different, it's an amazing thing to be in a room where you no longer feel different for whatever the reason the difference is. If it has to do with gender or religion or kind of food you eat or the way your body looks or your sexuality or your whatever it is. It's a really remarkable experience to finally be in a room and not feel different than the other people in the room. So I was living a really happy life then. I don't want to make it sound like I was really unhappy. I, I was living in Los Angeles and I had lots and lots of friends. I went out all the time. I had a job that I really enjoyed. I was adjacent to the entertainment industry that I loved. And fitness was a really big thing back then. Everybody went to the gym <laughs> and I hated the gym. I've, I, I won't say this is a present tense. I used to hate exercise because growing up, I had such terrible associations with gym class. I grew up in the age where we had to put on these weird gym suits and everybody had to do the same thing. I don't know how many of you remember the president's physical fitness test back in the 60s and 70s. And we all had to try to do the same things. And there was one part of the test where we would have to try to climb a rope. I hated this frickin' rope. So the rope was a big thick rope that dangled from of the gymnasium. And each one of us with everybody else looking on had to try to haul ourselves up the rope. And of course, the people with upper body strength and aerodynamically friendly bodies would skitter up the rope just fine. And I would dread my turn because I knew I wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't going to happen. It didn't happen last year. It's not going to happen next year. And it wasn't going to happen the year that I was in. And so it would be my turn and I'd hear the giggles and it was before I knew to tell them to shut the F up and, <laughs> you know, advocate for myself. I was young and just trying to fit in with everybody else and I would bring myself to the rope and I would, you know, try to hold on and jimmy my feet up just so and I would go nowhere. And, um, you know, it's like, can we just all agree that aerodynamically I'm not getting up this rope? I can do other super cool things, but this isn't my thing. But I couldn't say that. And you know, of course, I wouldn't pass that test. So I did not have very good associations with exercise. I didn't mind being active. Like I didn't mind dancing the whole night. I didn't mind going for a long walk. I love to shop, right? So I would walk along through big malls and, you know, up and down um, boardwalks and I didn't mind being active, but I hated exercise. And now I'm living in an era with these frickin' leotards and tights and step aerobics and, oh my God, it was horrible. <laughs> it was just awful. So along comes Richard. Richard, this very intriguing guy. Like, he just seems like he's a lot of fun. And I don't remember how I found out about Slimmons, but finally, 
whether he was on a show or something, and he mentioned his exercise studio, Slimmons, in Beverly Hills. And I was like, okay, now I have a name and I can look it up. And sure enough, I go to the yellow pages under gyms or whatever they were called back then. There's all these huge ads, right? Bally's, Bally's was a big one back then, and the other ones, and YMCA. And there was this little type, it wasn't even an ad, just put in there somewhere, Slimmons on Little Santa Monica Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Again, no internet, so I can't look them up and see what their schedule is. So you have to call. And so I called one day, and I think I stopped by actually to pick up a schedule and hear more about their classes. And the way it worked back then was when Richard was in town, because he traveled all the time, but when he was in town, typically he taught sweat into the oldies on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And an hour before the sweat into the oldies class, he would have a class about food and, and dieting and like how to, how to eat better kind of thing. I don't remember what it was called. So usually you would go for the first class and then stay for the second class. And for the first class, usually what would happen is we would all be sitting on the floor. We would bring, a, you know, you bring a towel or something to sit on. And Richard would share with us basically inspiration. He would give us a pep talk about how to eat and how to take care of ourselves and and he would love us the way Richard would love people, right? You can do it. <laughs> Don't eat the cookie, <laughs> whatever it was he would say. And we would all feel very seen, right? If anybody has been struggling with food, being able to talk about the seduction of a cookie is actually helpful because you realize you are not the only person who struggles with food. And once that first class was over, then the second class would start, which would be the sweat into the oldies. And back then, Richard had records, vinyl, that he would play. So he would be playing DJ, right, while we were exercising, and he would change the music and put on the track that he wanted. And he would be front and center and there were, was, of course, mirrored walls, because that's what every gym had. And I just remember we would be, like, running back and forth in the room, shaking our hands and shaking our hips. And he would have us, you know, do different exercises. And at some point, we would get down on the floor, and we would do sit-ups and leg lifts. And he had so much energy. You know, he had so much energy and he shared that with us. So, so back to Richard traveling so much. I don't know what he was like or is like in a very personal, intimate way, but I can tell you what he was like for those of us who turned to him for inspiration. He was our champion. He traveled all around the country, constantly teaching classes. And almost everywhere he traveled, he would find out who really needed to hear from him. And he would make phone calls, and he would go visit people. So if he knew that someone was a shut-in because of their weight, he would go see them. And he would sit by their bedside or sit by them on the couch and he would tell them that they mattered and that they were important and that they could do this. Oh, I'm just getting emotional as I say that. And, and he would follow up with them. He would call them on a regular basis. I have no idea how many people he was doing this for, but it was a lot. And Every once in a while in class, there would be a special guest and he would say, this is so-and-so from 
you know, Omaha, Nebraska, and we've been talking for a year, and this is the first time they've been on a plane, and they're here to participate in the class, and we would all cry, like we were all cheering each other on, and any time one of us could get on a plane or go on an adventure, it was worthy of celebration, and this was what he devoted his life to. There were people all around this country and perhaps internationally that had Richard as their champion. He would call them, he would write them letters, he would visit them. And so for those of us who were blessed to go to Slimmons, we got to experience it firsthand. And he poured his heart and soul into every single one of those classes. He never phoned it in. He left it all on the field, as they say. And wherever you were on your own fitness journey or weight journey, you were welcome there. Some people would do the class from their chair because they could not stand or do the vigorous workout that Richard would have us do and they would get cheered on just as loudly it's like no matter what you could do you were a champion right if you were sitting in your chair and you were just doing your arms you were awesome that was one of the first experiences that I had as a a sized person of not feeling embarrassed about my size. Like, I didn't mind that I was in my leotard and tights because we were still wearing them back then (laughs) in that room. Like, in that room I fit. There were other bodies that looked like my body. In that room, I belonged. In that room that my hair would get frizzy and I would sweat and turn bright red as I ran up and down the room with Richard. I belonged there. You know, you know, I don't know why it is, but when I used to go to the gym before Richard, like the regular gym and step aerobics, I do not know how these women did not look unattractive when they sweat. <laughs> like these women, their hair still looked good. And and they looked beautiful. For me, I turn five shades of red when I exercise. I sweat and my hair gets frizzy <laughs> and I'm bright red like a tomato. There is nothing beautiful about me when I am engaged in exertion, <laughs> physical exertion. And I used to just be like, what, what is wrong with me? <laughs> As if this was something I would ever be able to change. I would try wearing makeup <laughs> to go work out, which is a horrible idea um, for me anyways. And I think of the people, you know, it's like when people are beautiful criers, you know, and just that single tear goes down their cheek. Oh my God, I'm an ugly crier. I, I turn bright red. I turn bright red when I'm happy. I turn bright red when I'm sad. (laughs) Like, I show everything um, as who I am. And so, when I would be at Slimmons, that I would be bright red. And my hair would be frizzing out all over the place. And, you know, I'd be all roly-poly in my leotard and tights. It didn't matter. And I think sometimes that is the greatest gift that we can experience is to find a venue in which we are normal and we are average and we fit in. And that was part of my experience at Slimmons. So for a long time, I went on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. And he had other instructors who were also wonderful So I would go on other days as well. And when Richard wasn't in town, one of the other teachers would sub the classes. And so they were great also. 
And there was a kinship there, like we all kind of understood each other. If you ever talk to somebody who shares similar issues as you, you know what that's like. It's like, oh my God, I know. <laughs> I get it. I understand. And that really was something wonderful that I received from Slimmons. And um, I remember years later, I had stopped going for whatever reason. And, um, you know, life changes, our course changes. And I would take my dog to a vet that was just a few blocks away from Slimmons. So Slimmons was still happening at that time. And sometimes on a Saturday morning when I would take my dog Tessa to the vet and we would be standing outside waiting for them to open, I would hear this bright, vibrant noise coming from Slimmons and I would hear Richard yelling like, come on, five more. And you'd hear the women and men, I guess men would be there too, cheering and such a vitality and vibrancy. And I would always smile to myself and think that is the most wonderful sound. And so this is my love note to Richard Simmons. You know, over the past few years, there's been a lot of conjecture. Where is he? What is happening? And I don't know that that's any of my business. I, I just hope he's happy and he's well cared for and he's loved. But you know, earlier when we're talking about earth angels, to know that one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is my love letter to Richard Simmons. Like you have no idea how many lives have breathed easier because you have lived, my friend. I don't think I'll ever hear this, but this is just what I would say to him. You made a big difference in my life, for sure. Simmons was one of the first places where I could be who I was in a leotard and not feel shame. That's profound. And I loved that people who were larger than me, people who were less fit than I was, also could come into that room and feel welcomed and feel loved, and feel accepted, and feel part of a beautiful and vibrant community. It's been a huge ripple that his life has had in this world. Especially for so many of us in the early days that we did not know better what was happening with our bodies. So perhaps Richard had an influence, a positive influence on you too. And if so, I just want to send you love as well. It was a remarkable experience to get to be a part of his community for so many years. And it helped me heal at a very deep level. It's not that I got thin. Almost no, nothing I ever did got me thin. <laughs> but these experiences, like the one that I had with Richard, helped me see myself through new eyes. It helped me gain a bigger understanding of what was possible for me. It helped me feel more accepting of who I was and my experiences. And I think often those are the greatest gifts that we can give to each other. So it's interesting, you know, I, I look back at those years and I so feel for all of us who grew up in plus-sized bodies, especially back then, because we were sold a bill of goods that it was our fault. We still are, actually. Right? It's like, have you tried fill in the blank? Have you tried keto? Have you tried eating watermelon? Have you gone vegan? Are you doing intermittent fasting as if there is a magical answer that we have not yet figured out? And I still, honestly, I do not think we know the answer yet. I do feel optimistic, though, 
that in the next 20 to 40 years, it will be understood. And there will be meaningful treatments for this dysregulation within the body. Because I will tell you, I have tried every single thing. Everything. If you want to ask me, have I tried? The, just know the answer is yes. Yes. And I'm at peace with where I am now. I'm at peace with this beautiful body of mine. I'm at peace living in plus sizes. And I'm at peace with what I look like when I exercise. It's one of the blessings of growing older. I'm 60 years old now. I've gotten a degree in spiritual psychology with an emphasis in consciousness, health, and healing. I have learned so much about myself and about my relationship with my body and how I fit in this life. And so this part of my journey no longer brings me the pain or the shame it once did. It's, thank goodness, that part has been profoundly healed for me. I love this body. This body's awesome. This body lets me be here and speak into a microphone so that I can whisper to you and you can drift off to sleep. And my body is bigger than some bodies. <laughs> and who cares? Like it is what it is. I feed my body well. I take good care of it and it takes good care of me. But the me that I was in the 80s and the 90s did not know that. The me who I was back then, I was looking for healing, compassion, understanding. And I received that from Richard and his Slimmons community. They modeled for me that I could move and have fun. That working out could be joyful and that all I had to do was what I could do, right? Other people could do more than I could and so what? I could do what I could do. And I so appreciated his inclusivity of everyone because when we build communities that are filled with love and compassion. There's room for all of us. And Slimmons was my home for a long time. And Richard was a champion for me. And so many of us. He brought us in from the sidelines. And he made his videos. And he went on talk shows and he put himself out there so that many of us would know that we had not been forgotten or left behind. So here's to all of those people who've done that for us throughout our lives. And this is why I wanted to do this love note for Richard. I just... I don't know when I see these different documentaries and stuff coming up on my For You feed, I think, you know what, I, I want to tell my story, which is, he was a champion for me, for all of us. He showed up when no one else would. He showed up and he made it okay for people who would exercise in a chair. That they mattered. That all of us mattered. That the person who couldn't leave their house because they were housebound. They mattered. We all mattered. And I want to make sure that that part of the story is told because there are thousands, maybe millions of us whose lives were made better because of what he shared with us. So thank you so much, Richard. I don't think you'll ever hear this, but 
I put my gratitude into the ether and ask the angels to bring it to you wherever you are. That your life has made a profound difference for many, many of us and your kindness and your generosity, your persistence, your willingness to show up when it was likely not easy to show up. I honor you for that and I'm grateful for you. And so my beautiful friends, thank you for letting me share this with you. Thank you for witnessing this part of my story. Thank you for letting me share with you about this really lovely human being. Thank you for letting me share with you about one of my earth angels. Again, I don't know what he's like on a on a intimate basis. I, I don't I don't have any insight about that, but he was a wonderful messenger for me. He was a wonderful encourager for me. And I'm grateful. And I'm grateful for you, my friends. How awesome are you? I know that you are an earth angel too and This world is better because you are here and you inspire my heart more than you know. I love you. I thank God for the gift of you and I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I wish you joy and goodness and I'm grateful. So thank you, my loves. You rest well. And we'll talk again soon. Sweet dreams.